Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to talk about a cartridge from Spain in the early 1950s. A cartridge that is pretty obscure, but technically very interesting, and one that's also responsible for a pretty pervasive myth about Setme rifles, and in particular FR8 and FR7 bolt-action rifles. So the cartridge is the 7.92 by 41 mm Setme cartridge. And where this begins is actually Spain in February of 1950. Uh, the Spanish government wanted a new rifle, a semi-auto rifle. Of course, at this point they're still using Mauser bolt-action rifles, and they have a pretty extensive set of uh, experimental designs going on. And what they decided to try and take advantage of was this group of Mauser engineers who had been uh, responsible for working on a lot of the German small arms developments involved in the STG 44 and 45 in World War II. A lot of these guys were at that point working in France for the French, and they weren't very happy with it. And the Spanish thought that they could basically just poach this group of engineers and have these guys design them a cool new rifle. So in 1950, the Spanish military talking with one of these German engineers came up with uh, an RFP, basically a list of the things that it wanted in its new rifle. And these were a maximum weight of 3 kilograms, that's 6.6 .6 pounds, that's not very much, an effective range of 800 to 1000 meters, that is quite a lot. Uh, they wanted it to have a folding stock, so it could be used by airborne troops and vehicle crews and such, and they also wanted it to be able of, uh, capable of fitting both a bayonet lug and a grenade launcher, not necessarily at the same time. And Germans these Mauser engineers got together and started talking amongst themselves, and realized immediately the, the, the conundrum, the problem that this set of requested characteristics posed. Namely, they wanted a rifle that was uh, effective at very long range, and also extremely light. And by the way, this was a select fire rifle, it had to be full auto. And these are basically impossible things to balance. How do you have a, in order to have a rifle uh, that is effective at a thousand meters, it has to have a lot of muzzle energy to get a bullet there. And remember, it has to get a bullet there, like, above the transonic range, because when a bullet starts to go through the sound barrier, it's going to impact its own sonic boom, its own um, pressure wave, and that's going to destabilize the bullet substantially. So your accuracy really drops significantly when you cross the speed of sound. So they had to keep it supersonic out to a thousand meters, and yet they also had to have it light enough recoiling that you could actually fire the thing in full auto with some usable result. Uh, when these same engineers had uh, worked on this problem during World War II, the solution was make a much smaller cartridge, make the 8x33 Kurtz cartridge, where you don't care that it's not effective at a thousand meters, because no one's going to be using it out there anyway. That's what combat uh, documentation showed. Up past 500 no one was ever actually taking effective shots anyway, so why bother making the cartridge uh, powerful enough to do it? But the Spanish maybe didn't have this same combat experience. They insisted on the, the long uh, effective range. So uh, what the German engineers came up with was uh, they said they had to increase the weight to 4 kilos from 3. So maximum weight goes from 6.6 .6 pounds up to 8.8 .8 pounds, and at that point they thought this was a feasible project. Now, I should point out, the caliber that was chosen for this rifle was 7.92 millimeter, say 8 millimeter, um, really only because that was the caliber that a lot of these guys had experience with, and since there was no existing international standard, they just decided to stick with that. Um, this does predate the 7.62 NATO development trials, we'll touch on those, those have an impact later on in this story. But Suffice to say, they stuck with 8mm. And one of these German engineers was a guy by the name of engineer, uh, Dr. Engineer, so a doctor of engineering, uh, Gunter Voss. And he came up with a really brilliant solution to what appeared to be an insoluble paradox. And that was a bullet that was extremely long. Um, the, the actual projectile itself was 1.8 inches long. That's 46 millimeters. I mean, this is massively longer than anything anyone else had ever done. And it had to be that long in order to have a really good aerodynamic, uh, uh, well, what we would call a ballistic coefficient today. It had to be a really good aerodynamic shape. Nice and long, so that it can, it doesn't lose a lot of velocity as it travels. That's essential, keeping it moving fast uh, to maintain accuracy at very long range. 
However, in order to minimize the recoil, they made it out of aluminum. So it's a very lightweight bullet. This thing came out at basically 106 grains. That's uh, 6.8 grams. A really lightweight bullet. Now, that seems like a good solution right there, and if that if it was as easy as that, people would have figured this out long ago. The problem was, you can't quite get away with that, because if you have that light of a bullet, it doesn't stabilize well. And so what Voss figured out, the, really the genius element of this bullet, was uh, around the middle of the bullet he had a copper, semi-copper jacket. So the bullet is kind of lozenge-shaped, so only the middle section is actually in contact with the barrel, and on that point he had wrapped copper around the outside of the bullet. Uh, it was still an aluminum core, but it had a copper, basically a copper band around about the middle half of the bullet. What this did, first of all, it made for better rifling engagement. Better than trying to run aluminum on a steel, uh, copper bullets are better for that. Um, but more importantly, it added this uh, much denser material around the outside of the bullet, so that when the bullet is spinning, you had a lot of mass on the outside that, think of this like a flywheel, it kept the bullet spinning and stabilized much better than an aluminum-only bullet would have. There wasn't, when the, if the bullet was solid aluminum, it wouldn't have much inertia keeping it spinning. Um, the copper did that. And so this combination of an aluminum body with a copper band around the middle actually gave them a bullet that was low recoil, and maintained velocity out to a thousand meters, or a little bit more. Uh, they, the number they actually came up with, the goal they were looking for to assure controllable full auto fire, was 0.75 kilograms per second of recoil impulse. And to put that in perspective, 7.62 NATO has, in its original form, has a recoil impulse of like 1.16 kilograms per second. So we're talking maybe something like 60% the recoil impulse of 7.62 NATO, and that was to allow it to be fired full auto effectively. This combination actually worked, and these engineers, now working, these former Mauser engineers, later to become HK engineers, at this point in the story working for SETME in Spain, put together a rifle. The, they actually had two. They initially experimented with both a flapper-locked rifle, action similar to the G43, and a roller delayed action that was the evolution of the Sturmgewehr 45M, uh, which would, this whole thing becomes very quickly uh, the HK-91 or HKG-3 rifle. At this point, they put it together, they do some testing, they have what they call the Modelo 1 and the Modelo 2. One is the G43 action, two is the roller delayed action. The Modelo 2 turns out to be better. <clears throat> it's uh, it's a lighter weight gun, it allows them to have more strength in the parts where they need strength without having to add mass for things like gas pistons. Uh, and that rifle looks really good. Um, by 1952 it was in trials in Spain. In fact they had the prototypes ready by like September of 1950, so a fairly rapid development process, largely because this rifle was the direct development of the Sturmgewehr 44 and 45. So the engineers building it already knew the basic principles of what they were doing, they were just adapting it to some specific Spanish requirements, this new cartridge, and improving it in ways that they had been wanting to improve it since World War II. So uh, part, the, the rifle goes into Spanish testing in 1950 through 1950, the end of like 1952, Spanish really like it, this looks pretty good. Uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds in the US gets one in 1954 and runs it through a whole battery of tests where it does really well. This is a very reliable rifle, it's a pretty accurate rifle, it is a remarkably effective rifle to fire full auto, seems pretty good. Now you can recognize these early setmes because they have a curved magazine, unlike the straight magazine that would follow later. So they're pretty easy to spot, and they look really crude and kind of awkward. Uh, very minimalist, and that's because in order to make the strict weight limit on this rifle, they're keeping all the extraneous stuff off. So, for example, the handguard is the bipod. When you fold out the bipod, you no longer have a front handguard, uh, and that's a, a weight saving measure. That bipod is pretty much necessary to have any chance of hitting anything out at a thousand meters. But where this all goes awry is when, when the, the 762 NATO development process becomes known to the Spanish. They decide that they do in fact want to use this new European international standard cartridge. 
And the problem is, you can't just drop that into this SETME Modelo 2 rifle, because the SETME has been designed for a remarkably low recoil cartridge. And when they almost double the, the recoil impulse of the cartridge, by say dropping 7.62 NATO into it, you have serious durability issues with the gun. You start cracking receivers and you know, the gun's beating itself to pieces. So the, the SETME team went through a couple iterations hoping that they could preserve this really fairly innovative bullet design, and none of it works. Um, ultimately what they have to do is adapt a cartridge that is dim uh, dimensionally identical to 7.62 NATO. And what they do is they reduce the bullet weight from 147 grains to 113 grains. It's, um, well, it's basically the same weight, just about the same weight as their original very long uh, ballistically elegant bullet. They drop, they, they take a solid, a traditional lead core, lead, uh, lead core copper jacket bullet. Um, they actually, sorry, they make a, a uh, hybrid lead plastic core with a copper jacket. So it's the same size as a standard 7.62 NATO bullet, but it weighs a little bit less. That becomes known as the 7.62 SETME cartridge. And with that cartridge the rifle can, the rifle works fine. Uh, the problem is this didn't really last effectively. Spain wanted to use the 7.62 NATO, and ultimately what they did is beef up the SETME rifle to the SETME Model C, which is the one that was ultimately formally adopted in large numbers by the Spanish military, and that's the SETME that we're familiar with today. That's also the rifle that would be basically adopted by the German military as the G3, the Gewehr 3. So by that point the 7.62 SETME is gone. This was only a very short term, you know, maybe we can get away with having our own special cartridge and still maintain some of the lighter recoil benefits of the rifle we originally had, and it went out the window. Unfortunately today there's not a lot of information about this cartridge, and the, the theory has developed along the way, uh, well before the internet I believe, that 7.62 SETME was the cartridge for the SETME rifles, because it was lower powered and the SETME rifles were, take your pick of which story, made of cheap Spanish steel, or badly designed, or something, you name it. Uh, and couldn't handle 7.62 NATO, so they had this lesser cartridge. Uh, and this story has kind of wiled its way onto the Spanish bolt-action rifles from the same period, the FR7s, which were uh, early pattern, like I think 1893 Mausers, uh, rechambered or rebarreled for 7.62, and the FR8 rifles, which were more modern 1916 pattern rifles, adapted, rebarreled to 7.62 NATO. These were both used as uh, basically National Guard training rifles, second line rifles by the Spanish military. People assume that the FR7 in particular, because it's the older version of the Mauser, can't handle the pressure of 7.62 NATO, so it's supposed to fire 7.62 SETME. This is in fact not the case. The FR7 and FR8 were both intended to be fired with standard 7.62 NATO ammunition. That 7.62 SETME light loading just did not last very long and was never made a formal adopted cartridge. So that is the story of what started off as a cool German post-World War II innovation that ended up uh, kind of clobbered by 7.62 NATO. It is in fact one of many potentially interesting ideas uh, that uh, met their doom at the hands of American insistence on a cartridge that had all of the power of the original 30-06 Springfield. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, hopefully you learned something interesting today. If you enjoy seeing this, consider checking out my Patreon account, it's the folks there that make this all possible. Either way, thank you very much for watching.